Okay, nucleation of methane hydrates is a fascinating problem. It's been around for a long time, and there are a lot of reasons to try and understand this system. Uh, first, what is a methane hydrate? Uh, you can probably see a lot of other videos on YouTube to demonstrate things like this, where you have uh, what looks like ice macroscopically, but it's flammable. And it's flammable because in the, in the ordered structure of the, the water molecules, you have little pockets uh, that are formed. So, the, so the, the waters are arranged with these little cages, and inside each cage there's a little free space, a little void, uh, where, a, where a hydrophobic guest molecule can sit. Uh, so, for example, natural gas, um, methane, ethane, or, or CO2 can also sit in here. Uh, and, and in these cages, they tile space in a way that fills space and looks much like a zeolite, if you're familiar with those things. Uh, and in here, in this picture now, sort of zooming out uh, just a little bit, you see uh, the waters now are colored just red, and they re the bars here represent hydrogen bonds between adjacent oxygen molecules. Uh, so they're not showing the hydrogens anymore. And, and the guest now is just this little black united atom representing methane. methane. And, and so this is a structure one natural gas hydrate. There are also structure two and structure H and a few, few other forms. Uh, so, um, so these hydrates are fascinating. One, because they are a, a massive fossil fuel reserve. So they're very difficult to tap. And they recently had a lot of press because, of, because a company in Japan uh, figured out how to inject CO2 into hydrate reservoirs and get CH4 uh, to come back up, right? So this was a, a long, long-term goal, and I think it's finally been demonstrated that this can actually occur. So this is driven, of course, because the CO2 hydrate is actually more stable than this, the methane hydrate is. So the CO2 pumped down at high pressure into a natural gas hydrate reservoir will the natural gas hydrate will begin to disintegrate. It will give up the CH4. It will burp effectively, and you have uh, you have now created. You're now creating a CO2 uh, hydrate reservoir. So this is both a way of sequestering CO2, and also a way of recovering uh, methane out of these uh, natural gas reservoirs uh, in the form of gas hydrates. Uh, so note that the gas hydrate is actually more plentiful plentiful than all other fossil fuels combined. Uh, so, so in principle, if we could do this efficiently, there's a lot down there. Uh, and, uh, and you know, also it's quite common that hydrates are are sort of a nuisance. They they plug natural gas pipelines. Uh, they form at high pressures and low temperatures, which is exactly what you have when you're transporting natural gas and through a cold region like Alaska. Uh, so this, of course, can be quite a problem. Also, uh, high pressures and low temperatures. Uh, exist where you're trying to uh, to drill for oil and in uh, deep sea uh, oil wells. Uh, this was illustrated. The problems associated with this were illustrated quite dramatically in 2010. Uh, remember, there was this oil well blowout in the Gulf of Mexico, and when they were trying to cap the oil well, uh, the wellhead, uh, the the hydrates were forming on the equipment and preventing them from making a good seal. And so, so basically for all of these reasons, there's a, a lot of motivation to try and understand how methane hydrates form. And, uh, and so many people naturally have thought about this in the past, and there are several different mechanistic ideas for how they form. The predominant mechanisms that have been put forth in the literature are this labile cluster hypothesis put forth by Dendy Sloan and coworkers at Colorado School of Mines. Uh, and that one says, uh, well, I won't go through the details. Let me just point out to you that uh, that this is a homogeneous methane hydrate nucleation mechanism in the sense that there's only methane and water in solution with each other uh, involved in this process. There's no catalyst, no dirt, no, no sediment, nothing is actually facilitating this, uh, this uh, hydrate nucleation mechanism in this story. Uh, alternative ideas were put forth by Trout and co-workers in 2002. Uh, so they put forth this local structuring hypothesis uh, which is a little bit of a different uh, sequence of events, but again, it's a homogeneous mechanism for methane hydrate nucleation. And yet another homogeneous mechanism for methane hydrate nucleation was put forth by Val Molinaro and coworkers. Uh, and this one basically looks like the two-step nucleation mechanism of, of Frankel and Tenwald in some ways, uh, but without the, without the metastable fluid-fluid uh, equilibrium here. Uh, so, so this is uh, this is also quite interesting, and and you know we were looking at all of these different hypo different hypotheses that have been put forth in the literature, and wondering you know if it would be possible to use rare events methods to actually decide which mechanism is correct at which conditions, and 
Uh, there, there are many people thinking about this question, and, and uh, rare events methods are particularly tough to use for, uh, for these systems because they are two-component systems, right? So this, most of the rare events methods that we have work best when you have a single-component structural transition. Uh, they don't work so well when you have a uh, two-component system. You have to deal with the slow diffusion transport. You have to deal with also the, the structural transition that's happening. And of course, we don't really have even good order parameters to describe those things because the, the, the characters involved in the process are non-spherical molecules. Okay, so, so what people have, have done in many cases is to abandon rare events and go back to using brute force simulation methods. And, and in, in many cases, they're running their simulations at conditions where the system is so highly driven, the driving force is so large for nucleation, that nucleation will actually happen in just tens of nanoseconds of waiting time, even though the observation volume is only, is only, uh, only hundreds of cubic nanometers. Okay, so this is just astronomically fast. Now, a much slower and much more reasonable uh, set of simulations were done in this paper. This is the group of the Colorado School of Mines. This is Dindy, Dindy Sloan and, and Amadeo Sum and David Wu working with Matt Walsh. Uh, and, and what they did was, was quite nice. They have a, they have a uh, bubble in their simulation box and they're able to run NPT simulations this way and effectively control their supersaturation as the nucleation process, ha process is happening. Uh, so this was quite an innovation. And, and they can actually see with this framework that the induction times are on the order of microseconds, right? So they pushed this process to to a point where it can now occur more slowly, and it and it occurs uh, it occurs on about a hundred times slower than other people had achieved, uh, but it's still quite fast, right? So even though the induction time is typically about a microsecond before you see a nucleus form in this simulation box, uh, the estimated rate that you get. Uh, from looking at the size of their simulation box and the typical induction times is about 10 to the 26 nuclei per cubic, per cubic centimeter per second. Now remember that the fastest nucleation rates that we can measure are on the order of 10 to the 21 nuclei per cubic centimeter per second. In a few cases, levitation experiments might be able to get out to like 10 to the 23 or so. Uh, but this basically is beyond the range of what can be tested. And uh, it's also about 10 to the 30 times faster than the specific estimates that have been generated in, uh, in conditions in the laboratory looking at methane hydrate nucleation. You know, their estimates there are like 10 to the minus 4 nuclei per cubic centimeter per second. So they're driving the process about 10 to the 30 times faster than, than what it typically happens at more realistic conditions. And, and so, you know, there's a, a good question whether you can look at the events that are happening in these, in these trajectories and actually trust that they are representative of what happens at the much slower conditions where, where things happen in the laboratory or where things happen in nature. Uh, and, and that's not to say that the insights in this simulation are wrong. Uh, they are reflecting a process that's happening at a much higher driving force. Okay, so, so they're fast. Effectively, nucleation in these simulations is fast because the simulations are being run at an effective methane pressure of 32,000 atmospheres. Okay, so this is very, very high pressure. Uh, to put this in perspective, the Mariana Trench is about uh, is about a thousand atmospheres of pressure. So they're they're really really basically these conditions aren't accessible on on uh, the Earth's surface, and so so we don't expect this to really be representative of what's happening in nature. And we set out with uh, with Val Molinero. This is a graduate student of mine, Nathan or uh, Brandon Knott. I'm so sorry to Brandon. Uh, so Brandon Knott, working with Mike Doherty and Val Molinero, we set out to really uh, try and probe these nucleation mechanisms, and we, we came into all kinds of problems. First, we ran into the problem that it was very difficult to actually compute the supersaturation, right? So supersaturation is a key parameter in nucleation uh, processes. It's like as important for nucleation as temperature is for chemical reaction rates. Uh, so we really have to be able to specify what that supersaturation is. And, and this is the, the trick that we came up with for computing it, right? So you can prepare a long, skinny simulation box. You have uh, a layer of water uh, and in periodic boundary conditions that wraps through the back side of the box and comes out on this side. And we also have a layer of, of uh, methane gas, okay? So what happens now is that as we increase the pressure uh, pushing from the two ends of our simulation box, we can increase the pressure on the simulation box. The concentration of methane in the aqueous part of this system goes up and up and up, uh, resembling Henry's law. Uh, so this is the vapor uh, aqueous solution equilibrium. 
And you see that it actually passes through and beyond the concentration of methane in the liquid phase. Uh, once we go beyond about 100 atmospheres or so, we surpass the concentration of uh, methane in the aqueous phase when, in, when that aqueous phase is in contact with a uh, methane hydrate layer, right? So this is basically the, the two com incompressible phases here don't respond to pressure at all, and the concentration just remains static, uh, 100 millimolar. Uh, all the way across uh, this large pressure range. Uh, so this is now is the condition that we selected. We're going to work at 900 atmospheres, which does correspond to the bottom of the Mariana Trench, uh, sort of an upper bound in pressure. We're going to work at 273 Kelvin. The reason we chose this temperature is to avoid uh, a simultaneous driving force for ice nucleation. So many of the previous studies have been done at conditions that are about 250 Kelvin or 265 Kelvin or 225 Kelvin even. Uh, and at such low temperatures, it's not clear whether you should have uh, nucleation of ice or nucleation of, uh, of methane hydrate first, right? Um, so, you know, the, the, the video that shows the corona nucleating ice is a perfect example, right? That system, uh, if you uncap it, can nucleate carbon dioxide bubbles, but it can also nucleate ice crystals. It's metastable towards both processes. And in fact, one process can interfere with the other process. And that's something that we really wanted to avoid. Uh, we wanted to, to have a situation where we only had a driving force at a realistic condition. So this is, this is pretty typical out in nature. You find 273 Kelvin all the time. And we can find this pressure, at least in certain places on the Earth's surface. And so this is really a, a realistic condition where we know that we're, we're actually able to prepare a metastable state uh, here. So, so the studies that have been done at much colder temperatures, the, the starting point should probably be methane vapor in contact with ice not methane vapor in contact with liquid, which is the starting point for many of those studies. Uh, so the starting point, of course, is, is quite important for getting a realistic representation of the process that's happening. If you start with the wrong phases, uh, it's hard to argue that you're seeing the, the right things. Uh, so this, is, this gap now between the Henry's Law-like curve here and the hydrate solution equilibrium curve here uh, is the supersaturation. So at 900 atmospheres, when I have a vapor in contact with a liquid, uh, this is the concentration of methane in that liquid phase. After nucleation occurs and it forms a hydrate phase, that concentration will then drop uh, to the new equilibrium uh, concentration, which is much, much lower. And the ratio between the concentration here and the concentration there is 5.8. That is my supersaturation, this S factor, uh, that you saw in some of the other uh, nucleation works. Uh, so now what you would imagine is that why don't we just start with uh, a system like this and study nucleation, the formation of a methane hydrate nucleus inside this aqueous phase and do umbrella sampling and all of those things. Well, uh, it turns out that those things don't work very well when you have uh, a, a two-component system. Uh, there, are, there are reasons for that and I will cover it in another video. Uh, you can read about them in, uh, in J. Kim Fizz's 2011 paper that we wrote uh, a few years back, uh, if you can't wait. Uh, okay, so, so what we did instead is to uh, assume that our non-equilibrium trajectories of nucleation, so we can put a seed in the simulation box and we can watch how that seed grows as a function of time. And uh, the average rate of growth according to an overdamped Langevin equation, is related to the generalized driving force pushing the system to grow or shrink, uh, and the mobility at the top, uh, the mobility for, uh, for growth or shrink, uh, growth or shrinking along that nucleus size axis, okay? So this is, this is uh, basically what, what we've done. We've started with, with seeds of size 700 cages here, and you see that we're beyond the critical nucleus size because typically these seeds now are starting to grow as a function of time, right? So this is time along the bottom axis, nucleus size along, along the top, but it's nucleus size in these average simulation runs, uh, these dynamical off-equilibrium simulation runs. When you start with a seed of initial size 200, uh, it initially begins to shrink, and right around the size of 300 or so, you see that we seem to be, 300 to 400 seems to be in the vicinity of the critical nucleus size because on average, these things are basically staying on top of the on top of the nucleation barrier. And notice that they stay up there for on the time on the time scale of nanoseconds, right? They really take a long time to move. So this mobility is very small and, and that's the reason that umbrella sampling is so slow. If you want to 
uh, really think about it. Um, you know, umbrella sampling requires that you be able to sample. Even if you can deal with the barrier, you have to have some mobility. And basically in this system, you have very, very little mobility. Uh, so, so now how can we, uh, how can we compute this term? Uh, I already showed that back in one of the elementary slides on, on uh, nucleation work. In fact, that was for this problem. So we've computed this uh, attachment frequency by looking at mean squared displacement as a function of time uh, at the top of the barrier. Uh, we can also uh, identify this generalized force from classical nucleation theory. Okay, so here's the, the bulk driving force, and this is the surface contribution. So this one, actually, when the nucleus is small, can actually flip the sign of this term. So at very large sizes, this thing wants to grow. Uh, but when this term, when, when n becomes small, this term becomes very large, and uh, it can actually drive the nucleus to shrink instead. Okay, and that's basically what you're seeing here in these trajectories. So there are a few unknown parameters here. We've got a shape factor. We've got an interfacial free energy. Uh, the shape factor, basically they're spheres, right? So I can show you pictures of what these nuclei look like, and I will in a moment. Uh, but basically they look like they're spherical nuclei. Uh, I've already shown you how we can compute the driving force, the, the chemical potential difference driving force. And we are using Val Molinaro's cluster size uh, algorithm so she can identify cages and then we cluster adjacent cages to to identify uh, the size of our methane hydrate nucleus at any given time in our simulation and and this is the data this is the way the data looks it's uh, it's basically data that represents the average uh, size evolution as a function of time starting from some initial condition okay so what we're gonna do here we're gonna take all these things that we know and there's one thing that we don't and that's the interfacial free energy parameter uh, and we're going to do a least squares fit on this data. So there's some value of the interfacial free energy parameter that should match all of these different curves uh, that are going in different directions for a single value of the interfacial free energy. Okay, so that gives us 31 millijoules per meter squared. Uh, there are experimental estimates of the interfacial free energy for a methane hydrate in contact with aqueous solution that are 32 millijoules per meter squared. Uh, can't get more lucky than this. I mean, uh, clearly is an indication that we're doing something right here, uh, but also the fact that these things really precisely align with each other, I think, is an indication that we got a little bit lucky. Um, but nevertheless, now we know everything in our classical nucleation theory rate expression. We know the interfacial free energy. We know the driving force. We know the shape factor. Uh, and we can now plug them in uh, to the prefactor and the uh, barrier expressions. Uh, we estimate that the barrier is 305 kT, and using the classical nucleation theory, we estimate that the rate uh, constant is then going to be 3 times 10 to the minus 112 nuclei per cubic centimeter per second. There's the confirmation that our nuclei are spherical. This is a picture of the nucleus at our estimated critical size uh, of 350 cages. Okay, so uh, so this is um, so this is. This is interesting because basically the rate that we got here is zero, right? So this is really, really extremely, extremely slow. Uh, to put it in perspective, if the entire ocean was in contact with methane at the pressure of the Mariana Trench, then a single, and at zero Kelvin, a single nucleation event would still take 10 to the 79, 10 to the 79 years. Now, even if you argue that classical nucleation theory makes errors on the order of 10 to the 20 or 10 to the 30 or so, you know, if I change this exponent by, by 30, uh, I still have an astronomically long time. It's basically impossible for this to be happening, uh, at least according to our results, it's impossible for this to be happening by any of the homogeneous nucleation mechanisms. So it must be heterogeneous nucleation, and of course that's a very, very difficult uh, question to ask. Uh, and, you know, heterogeneous nucleation can take many forms, and, uh, and I think that uh, quite a few people are now now working on trying to understand what kind of heterogeneous nucleation this could be, looking at, uh, at clay surfaces and, and uh, graphite surfaces and things of that sort. Uh, so uh, you should hear more about methane uh, hydrate nucleation from this guy soon. This is a new graduate student of mine working on this problem, Jeff Poon, uh, and he has a, a nice idea that we're just starting to develop now. So let me thank... Uh, let me thank uh, some key collaborators, Val Molinero at the University of Utah, uh, Amadeo Sum, and David Wu at Colorado School of Mines, uh, and also uh, I want to thank um, 
I want to thank Mike Doherty at the University of California at Santa Barbara and uh, Brandon Knott, who really did all the work. And, and Brandon was a graduate student at the time. Now he's working at uh, National Renewable Energy Laboratory with Greg Beckham. And uh, so thank you to all those people. And uh, you can see a little review on some of the methods uh, in this Advances in Chemical Physics article and uh, also some of these things, links to the, to the Journal of the American Chemical Society paper where we published these results uh, on our website. Uh, so those were published in 2012, if you want to do a, a search on that. And uh, we thank the NSF for a computational discovery and innovation grant that supported this work. And uh, of course, we're eager to pick up uh, industrial sponsors. Uh, I think, of course, this is an area that industry has a lot to gain from, so hopefully they will notice this.